Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are a very punctual people here at the Global Platform for the Right to the City. So let's get this course course started. Started. Sorry, today my English is not very well, and <laughs> I'm I'm very worried with the pandemics, ongoing pandemic. So this affects my ability to speak in English, and so sorry for that. But welcome everyone. It's very nice to see so much people here interested in discussing the right to the city and the different dimensions of the right to the city. This course is a long due initiative uh, of the global platform for the right to the city, which has a working group on research and capacity building. I'm one person in charge, kind of in charge of this working group. I'm in charge of animating this working group. So I'm very pleased to have everyone here today uh, and is starting this seven weeks uh, dialogue. It's going to be more than a class, but a dialogue, a dialogue that uh, starts from the experiences and initiatives of our platform members. So we will have here many partners of the global platform presenting uh, different initiatives, experiences, and dimensions of the right to the city, such as uh, the gender and diversity perspective on the right to the city, such as the importance of democratic uh, governance and political participation, such as social production of habitat, and so on. Today, we have a more introductory uh, discussion to start framing this dialogue and it's going to be an amazing times with two amazing fellows that we have here today with us uh enrique botelho frota which is the executive director of polis institute uh, he's a lawyer here in brazil with masters in environmental development and urban law and also we have here our dear friend uh, Desio Fernandes uh, from Lincoln Institute of Land Policies and DPU Associate, which is a very well-known researcher on the theme of uh, right to the city and urban law internationally, and has a large amount of writings, research, and consultancy. So thank you so much, Enrique and Desio, for being here today with us. Just before I give the floor to Enrique to start our uh, today dialogue, I just wanted to briefly raise some points of our uh, course today and for the next uh, few weeks. And if you could pay attention to these notes, they are very important because they are most of your questions that you are going to to ask ourselves yourselves and ourselves uh, during this next few weeks but if you pay attention now you will solve most of them so first of all uh we'll have here more than 400 uh, people that were uh that requested uh that registered for our course so we have more than 460 persons here. So, but we have a limitation of uh, spots available on this session in Zoom. So please do not share the link with friends or colleagues. If you want any, anyone else to be part of this course, please ask them to send us a message and we will try to fit in the in the in the registration to see if there is a spot for them. Uh, we will do our best to fit everyone that wants to be part of the course. But please do not share the link because for safety reasons as well. We know that many Zoom sessions they have been bombed, and we have to keep it safe for everyone to be a safe environment for everyone. Uh, secondly, 
it's amazing to know that uh, this uh, registration and these requests for being part of the course, they came from all regions of the world. We will have participants from Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, Middle East, North America, and many other regions as well. And this is very nice to see here because we believe that the idea and that the agenda of the right to the city have to be discussed and mobilized through different urban realities and uh, habitat realities throughout the world. So it's very nice to have you here. Uh, most of you probably already received a guiding document. It's a document that we sent, uh, I think yesterday. And if you do not receive, don't worry that we will send again. But if you are very worried about this, you can ask us as well. Uh, but this guiding document, it gives you directions on how everything is going to work within the seven weeks course. So it has links to our groups in WhatsApp. There's links to, to accessing Google Classroom and our drive with the material from the course. There is directions on how we are going to proceed to send to send you the link to be part of the each session. Uh, so this guiding document, it has 99% of all your doubts. So if you have any question, first you go to this do guiding document because the question and the answer will be there. So don't worry with that. If it's not there, please write us uh, an email, a message on the email that's uh, registered in the platform in the event, event three. And it's escola at polis.org.br or contact at uh, right to city.org. And we will manage to answer your questions as well. Uh, although we have a WhatsApp group, actually we will have two WhatsApp groups because uh, WhatsApp only can support 250 participants. So we are going to probably have two WhatsApp groups for the course. Uh, these WhatsApp groups, they are for exchange among the participants. Participants, So to introduce yourself, to let people know who you are and to, to share materials from your initiatives, to ask questions and informations to other participants, but they are not somewhere that you can uh, send us message to, to, uh, to answer your questions. Because since there are too many messages going on there, uh, we will not be able to monitor each question. So please write us in separate if you have any questions. Don't write on the WhatsApp group, okay? Because probably we won't answer your question. But please feel free to write anything else on the WhatsApp. Uh, of course, there are ethical limits on the ratio and uh, gender and other uh, ethical issues that we are not, uh, we cannot accept in the group. So just communications with uh, within ethical limits, of course. And also please try not to share materials that are protected uh, from property rights perspective as well. This is something that we ask people to not share. Only share that, uh, I'm so sorry, there is a lot of noise here and I can't control it. But uh, we are only able to share material that are copyleft or under Creative Commons and so on. Uh, another question is, uh, besides the WhatsApp group, we will have also a Google Classroom. Uh, it's a class to meet virtually each other in Google. And there we will put some challenges for you to answer some questions. And it's important for you to answer those questions. They are going to be very simple challenges and questions and tasks. It's just to keep the ball rolling and to keep everything moving and to share within us materials that are interesting, 
So probably we'll have some, some moment that we are going to ask you to share some video from your country that deals with the right to the city in some dimension or to share a music or to share some material. It's going to be a very easy challenge, but a very important to, to gather material for everyone to see the diversity of the right to the city through different countries and contexts and urban and uh, habitat contexts. So it's very important to be part of it. So uh, it's important also to answer those challenges because together with, with the presence on the online sessions, we will access who did those challenges and who were present at least in 75% of the classes to give the certificate at the end of the course. So if you want to have the certificate at the end of the course, you have to be present at 75% of our classes and to answer the challenges as well. And at the end of the course, we'll send you an evaluation. It's not to, to measure your knowledge, but it's to measure our course impact. So you are going to evaluate us. So this is also very important to us in order to improve next initiatives and to think better ways to connect with you. So this is also a requirement to the certificate at the end of the course. Uh, finally, uh, the presence is automatically generated by Zoom. But in order to, to assess this uh, presence, we need you to always be careful to choose your name properly. So you have to rename yourself. So you go to your uh, picture and you see the three dots on the right uh, upper corner, click on those dots and choose rename. And then you write your right name. We have to be very careful with renaming yourself because this is part to generate automatically the attendance list. So please do that. And if you don't know, you can ask her individual and we will answer how to do that, okay? And finally, if you cannot be present at one or another meeting, no worries. All the sessions, they are going to be recorded. Uh, for now, we are actually recording right now. And we ask you this, uh, we are just letting you know that we are recording you this and we will make it the recording available for you on YouTube, on the YouTube of the global platform of the Right to the City, the GPR2C channel. So you can see after uh, the class, if you want to watch it again, there are people that want to watch one, two times the, the class, and that's not a problem. Or people that missed the class can watch later. So we will recording just for that purpose only. It's not for commercial, uh, commercial objectives, just for people who are part of the, the course, okay? So for now, these are the key messages that I wanted to share with you. You're probably going to ask me these questions again and again and again. It's no worries, it's fine. But always remember to consult the guiding document because there is the most part of the answers to your questions, okay? Uh, thank you very much again for being part of this course. And we will start now uh, thinking on what is the right to the city? Uh, how this discussion began? What is and what it's not the right to the city? What are the questions? And for that matters, I'm going to ask Enrique uh, Frota to, to lead us in this discussion. So Enrique, welcome and thank you so much for accepting our invitation to, to this first part of our online course. Thank you so much. Enrique, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Rodrigo. Thank ah, you so I can see you now. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today in this opening session of this course. Uh, congratulations, Rodrigo, and all the team of uh, 
that is organizing this. Uh, it's wonderful. Just one, just one, yeah. one issue, Enrique. I, I think I didn't mention, but there is translation in for Spanish and for English. If you click on the bar below, there is interpretation, and then you can choose the language, the channel for each language that you want to hear. So please choose this because the translation is there for you. Okay, thank you. So sorry, Enrique. No problem. Thank you. Uh, that's important because I'm going to speak in Spanish, <laughs> so the English uh, speakers can can send us feedbacks if the interpretation will be fine. And so I'm I'm going to change to Spanish right now. Eh, hola a todos y todas. Este es un placer estar aquí hoy en esta sesión eh, inaugural de este curso. Muchas gracias a Rodrigo y toda la equipo organizadora. Eh, es un honor especial de, de dividir este momento con Edesio Fernández, que efectivamente es un gran maestro eh, de derecho urbanístico, de los temas de justicia social y urbana. Es un referente internacional en esta área. Entonces, yo soy solamente un estudiante eh, que gustaría de compartir con ustedes acá hoy algunas ideas, pero creo que vamos a tener también eh, un momento muy especial eh, escuchando lo que Edesio también nos, nos traerá eh, en este día de hoy. Entonces, es un placer estar aquí. Yo voy a compartir una presentación eh, con... Uh, estas ideas y algunas imágenes, no se molesten, después yo voy a eh, permitir que la equipo organizadora comparta con ustedes esta presentación, eh, no hay problema, pueden utilizarla, eh, después la equipo les enviará también eh, para que utilicen o para que recuerden de los temas de esta clase. Bien, eh, lo tema principal de este curso es descifrar el derecho a la ciudad. Entonces, yo imagino que tratándose de una primera clase, tenemos que empezar dando los primeros pasos. Eh, ni todas las personas acá hoy son personas que están involucradas con el movimiento de derecho a la ciudad. Muchas trabajan con el derecho a la ciudad, están sensibilizadas con la temática, conocen la definición, los conceptos, pero creo que es importante también iniciar para que todos nos eh, eh, podamos disfrutar de este curso teniendo una base común conceptual, una base común crítica eh, de qué se refiere al derecho a la ciudad, cuáles son lo, las distintas visiones de derecho a la ciudad que hay, porque obviamente no hay solo una, un concepto, so, solamente una definición de derecho a la ciudad, pero creo que es importante conocer lo que la plataforma global para el derecho a la ciudad cree que debería ser eh, esta idea eh, de derecho. Entonces, al, así yo voy, yo voy a estructurar mi presentación. Rodrigo, por favor, te, eh, te solicito que, que me avise cuando eh, yo tenga cinco minutos para, para okay. cerrar, para, para no, no utilizar más tiempo do que, do que está permitido. Bien, entonces yo gustaría de empezar con algunas fotos de la última década de movimientos eh, masivos, de movimientos de reivindicación que se pasaron en muchas mucha ciudades eh, de distintos países y de distintas regiones eh, del globo, iniciando por esta que se quedó muy famosa en Istambul, 2013, una reivindicación en la plaza Taksim eh, contra un gran emprendimiento que quería quitar este espacio público eh, de uso eh, común de la población. Y la población se, se colocó contra este proyecto, ocupó las calles, ocupó la plaza. Y en, en este momento en, en Turquía, este movimiento específicamente reivindicaba de manera explícita el derecho a la ciudad. 
Então, eles estavam reivindicando o espaço público, mas movilizando uma ideia de direito à cidade. Lo mesmo também se passou em Brasil, em muitas manifestações massivas que ocorreram em 2013. Brasil, como é, muitos de vocês sabem, tem uma história super larga acerca do direito à cidade, de reivindicações, de logros institucionais é, sobre o direito à cidade. E aqui eu destaco este movimento de 2013, que se iniciou como um movimento por la democratização eh, de do sistema de mobilidade, de los preços de las tarifas de, de transporte público, mas não se quedou solamente en este aspecto específico de transporte público e se ampliou para uma reivindicação muito muy mais amplia sobre o direito à cidade. Porque os jovens, principalmente, este movimento era um movimento principalmente liderado por jovens e depois toda a gente foi a las calles eram milhões de pessoas em 2013 em las calles de Brasil não só em São Paulo, mas em muitas outras cidades de Brasil os jovens diziam que ter a possibilidade de eh, eh, deslocar por la cidade de, de se transportar por la cidade não é somente o direito de ir e venir, é também o próprio direito de ocupar a cidade e de acessar os equipamentos públicos da cidade, acessar os empregos na cidade. Então, esta ideia mais profunda de que eh, estavam reivindicando efetivamente um direito à cidade e não somente um direito ao transporte. O mesmo em Alemanha, por exemplo, nesta manifestação em Hamburgo, onde eh, explicitamente também reivindicam eh, a ideia de direito à cidade. Aqui em Berlim, também em Alemanha, eh, também um movimento que reivindica explicitamente o direito à cidade. Aqui em Buenos Aires, um movimento de resistência em la região de La Boca, que é muito famosa porque é uma região também um tanto turística, Ali está o estádio de futebol de, de Boca Juniors. Há também Caminito, que é uma calle bastante turística, mas o que a maioria das pessoas não sabe é que este é um bairro popular eh, e que há um forte processo de desalojos devido a, a grandes, eh, eh, um grande processo de... de renovação urbana e ele super elitista e este movimento que se chama La Boca Resiste e, e propõe também ao, ao reivindicar a permanência de los eh, moradores e moradoras em lo próprio bairro contra os desalojos efetivamente também está mobilizando a ideia de direito à la ciudad isto se passa há muitos anos este movimento é um movimento de grande resistência e as pessoas aqui na calle reivindicando seus direitos. O mesmo em Espanha, por exemplo, este não necessariamente de maneira explícita reivindica o slogan de direito à cidade, mas há uma conexão aqui sim com os movimentos de afetados por a hipoteca que estão protestando contra este fator específico de la toma de seus hogares eh, por, por las, pelos bancos, por las instituições financeiras, mas não é somente um movimento por la vivienda, é um movimento também por la cidade, por o direito de las pessoas viverem em hogares bem ubicados na cidade, por manterem as condições de seus hogares, de suas viviendas, então, de alguma maneira, também há aqui uma forte conexão com o direito à cidade. Aqui, nos Estados Unidos, a Aliança por o Direito à Cidade de Estados Unidos, isto mobiliza pessoas de muitos estados eh, distintos de, 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 de aquele país, eh, e há muitas ações interessantes, e aqui se vê, né, Take Back the City, ou... Vamos, vamos tomar nossa cidade, 
la idea de democracia, de derechos humanos y de poder. Después yo voy a hablar un poco más sobre eso porque son componentes centrales de la idea de derecho a la ciudad, la democracia, los derechos humanos y el poder, la participación. Acá en África del Sur, un movimiento también muy interesante que se llama eh, Reclaim the City, vamos a reclamar la ciudad, eh, la tierra por, para las persona, personas, no para los lucros. Entonces, acá también se reivindica esta idea más amplia, amplia de que cuando nos, nos ponemos contra los procesos eh, de desalojos, también esto, estamos nos, nos poniendo contra los procesos eh, más capitalistas de producción de espacio urbano, entonces estamos reivindicando también una otra posibilidad de constitución de este espacio urbano y de una ciudad como un derecho. Entonces, eh, después de estos ejemplos, eh, podría, podríamos aquí nos quedar con muchos otros ejemplos de otras ciudades, otros países, claro, pero tenemos un tiempo limitado, entonces son solamente para que eh, tengamos eh, esta idea de que el derecho a la ciudad está movilizando diferentes grupos, diferentes movimientos en contextos territoriales distintos, en países distintos, entonces, la pregunta es por qué el derecho a la ciudad moviliza tanto y cada vez más en los últimos años estos movimientos. Y yo les contesto acá utilizando un, un parágrafo del profesor David Harvey en este libro que se llama Ciudades Rebeldes. Creo que muchos y muchas acá uh, conocen este libro de David Harvey en que el profesor Harvey de cierta manera resgata eh, las ideas de Henri Lefebvre. Eh, y hay en la, en, en la parte de introductoria de este libro, Harvey hay este, eh, esta argumentación y yo estoy de, de acuerdo con él diciendo que no necesariamente estas personas que están yendo para las calles hoy leerán la obra intelectual de Lefebvre. No es porque nosotros hemos leído el libro El Derecho a la Ciudad de Lefebvre que automáticamente estamos nos movilizando, nos sensibilizando y creando movimientos populares de reivindicación de, de la ciudad. No, no es así. Eh, efectivamente las personas están se movilizando porque ellas necesitan se movilizar. Muchas de esas personas nunca leerán el libro de Lefebvre. Aún están, aún, eh, están eh, muy eh, eh, involucradas con esta idea de derecho a la ciudad. Entonces, lo que se pasa en las calles es muy más rico, es muy más importante para explicar este movimiento actual por el derecho a la ciudad do que necesariamente el movimiento académico. Y acá, por favor, eh, no me interpreten mal, yo no estoy acá eh, ignorando la importancia intelectual de Lefebvre o de otras personas que son académicas y que escribieron y que eh, continúan escribiendo eh, la teoría sobre el derecho a la ciudad, esta contribución es súper importante, es central. Lo que estoy argumentando es que no necesariamente los movimientos sociales están se moviendo porque leeron estos libros. Hay dos procesos paralelos que están ocurriendo aquí eh, en este momento. Hay un proceso teórico, intelectual, y hay un proceso activista sobre el derecho a la ciudad. Son procesos paralelos, hay puntos de contacto entre estos dos procesos, es evidente. Muchos académicos son también activistas políticos, muchos miembros de movimientos sociales también son personas eh, que investigan, que producen conocimiento, entonces no son movimientos, eh, aunque paralelos, no son movimientos separados, pero el argumento principal que para mí explica muy mejor eh, lo que se pasa en lo, los últimos años es la idea de que la vida nos moviliza a estar en las calles reivindicando otra ciudad y no los libros necesariamente.
Entonces, la pregunta que podríamos hacer de otra manera, la misma pregunta, es cómo explicar que todos esos movimientos eh, están se movilizando, movilizando a partir de contextos tan distintos. Estamos hablando de países en Europa, países en América Latina, países eh, de norte global, países de sur global, en África, en Asia. Entonces, son contextos urbanos muy distintos, eh, pero aún así, eh, muchos de esos movimientos están se movilizando alrededor de la idea de derecho a la ciudad. Entonces, hay, obviamente, un primer aspecto que es importante considerarmos, que vivimos en una sociedad global y que las fuerzas económicas y las fuerzas políticas son cada vez más globalizadas. Eh, tenemos muchos estudios sobre eso, relatorios oficiales sobre eso. Yo destaco, por ejemplo, todo el trabajo eh, de las relatoras y relatores de derecho a vivienda adecuada de la ONU. Eh, era la relatora anterior, eh, Leilani Fara, por ejemplo, ha producido muchos relatorios eh, indicando cómo grandes corporaciones globales están inversionando en las ciudades en todo el mundo y cambiando los procesos eh, de desarrollo urbano en todo el mundo. Entonces, hay una estructura global también funcionando independiente de los contextos locales. Este es un factor importante también para considerarmos. Entonces, eh, los colegas y las colegas que están aquí en la Ciudad de México, otros que están en Mumbai, en India, otros que están en ciudades de China, otros que están en Brasil o en Argentina, eh, pueden perceber que hay cier ciertos procesos que son muy parecidos en las ciudades en que viven y hay eh, cosas que son estructuras globales ahí, ahí se pasando independiente del contexto local. Pero no es solamente las, la, las fuerzas económicas que se globalizan, nosotros de los movimientos sociales, nosotros de la academia, nosotros que somos activistas, también estamos cada vez más nos globalizando. Obviamente es otra forma de globalización, como, como eh, describe el profesor portugués Boaventura de Sousa Santos, hay una globalización del capital, pero también hay un proceso de globalización de las resistencias. Entonces, los movimientos eh, populares, los movimientos sociales, también hacen intercambio entre sí, también hay procesos de aprendizaje entre estos movimientos, también hay, un, in, de, de cierta manera, un proceso de solidaridad internacional eh, que hace con que nosotros podamos aprender unos con los otros, lo que se pasa en un país, lo que se pasa en, en, en una ciudad, también promueve conocimiento y aprendizaje colectivo ahí. Y en este sentido, también los procesos de resistencia se eh, alimentan eh, de cómo nosotros estamos intercambiando. Entonces, independiente de que contextos locales son también específicos, son particulares, pero nosotros también estamos intercambiando y yo creo que esto es importante destacar a, a redes internacionales como la Plataforma Global por el Derecho a la Ciudad, por ejemplo, son responsables en gran medida por este proceso de solidaridad internacional y de aprendizaje colectiva internacional. Entonces, la idea de Derecho a la Ciudad también eh, está cada vez más ampliada y, y si, siendo, siendo apropiada por movimientos de todo el mundo. Y, obviamente, hay un mérito propio de la idea de derecho a la ciudad, porque el derecho a la ciudad tiene un potencial enorme, un potencial gigantesco para integrar agendas y luchas, luchas específicas. Eh, también el derecho a la ciudad tiene un potencial de articular diferentes voces y crear una idea de lucha común. O lo que una colega muy querida acá en Brasil, la profesora Bianca Tavolare, 
llama de una idea de un nosotros en común, una idea de colectividad. Y esto después, después es un punto a que yo regresaré porque eh, este es algo central eh, en el concepto de, del derecho, derecho a la ciudad, que es la idea de un derecho colectivo. Pero no solo como derecho colectivo, eh, en la perspectiva jurídica, pero también en la perspectiva social. Yo creo que Edesio después va a hablar mucho mejor que yo sobre eso, porque estamos hablando aquí por to eh, todo el tiempo de un proceso socio-jurídico. Entonces, el derecho a la ciudad también promueve esta idea de que eh, no hay una persona movilizada, hay miles de personas movilizadas. Y acá yo destaco con eh, una filosofía africana, eh, deriva, la palabra umbuto en, en, en África significa que yo soy porque nosotros somos. Entonces, eh, esto para mí es un ejemplo eh, significativo y y de que la idea de derecho a la ciudad pone de que yo soy porque nosotros somos, o sea, hay una colectividad en común. Y lo tercero aspecto que yo creo que es muy positivo desde la idea de derecho a la ciudad y que facilita que los mo distintos movimientos eh, articulen a partir de esta idea es que el derecho a la ciudad aterriza, localiza las injusticias y las desigualdades sociales en el territorio. Porque es muy común en muchos movimientos, en, en muchos procesos de crítica social, que el territorio no aparece. ¿no? Es, el territorio no está necesariamente evidente en los procesos de crítica social. Entonces, muchas veces cuando nosotros y nosotras nos preguntamos sobre, por ejemplo, la, los procesos de violencia de género o los procesos de discriminación racial, eh, ¿dónde estos procesos se pasan? Estos procesos no están se pasando abstractamente, flutuando en, en el aire. Estos procesos están se dando en contextos territoriales y el derecho a la ciudad siempre habla de estos contextos territoriales. Yo creo que esto es una fuerza, un potencial gigantesco de esta idea de derecho a la ciudad, porque las personas se conectan mucho más cuando hablamos de su propio territorio y no solamente de las cuestiones más abstractas eh, cuando nos referimos de desigualdades y justicias sociales. Entonces, hay un mérito propio eh, de, este, de esta idea de derecho a la ciudad. Entonces, como síntesis eh, de esta primera parte, yo diría que el derecho a la ciudad resgata la idea de que los territorios son creaciones colectivas y, por lo tanto, de que todas las personas merecen disfrutar de las ciudades, de los asentamientos humanos, de los pueblos, en las mismas condiciones. En, esta, en este sentido, el derecho a la ciudad también es un dere derecho de resistencia, también es un derecho de reivindicación política de grupos sociales históricamente subordinados, históricamente excluidos, para que estos grupos se organicen y reclamen por una otra sociedad y una otra ciudad. Entonces, el derecho a la ciudad comporta todo esto es una idea muy potente y yo creo que esta potencia explica en gran medida por qué tantos movimientos distintos están eh, reivindicando esta idea y utilizando activamente esta idea de derecho a la ciudad. No solamente como un eslogan, no solamente como una frase eh, publicitaria, por así, entre comillas, obviamente, eh, pero también a partir de un contenido profundo de reivindicación para, por una otra sociedad. Obviamente, eh, tenemos que hablar que este proceso es un proceso histórico, es un proceso que está en constante construcción y reconstrucción hace muchas décadas. Siempre tenemos que hacer una referencia obvia a Henri Lefebvre, 
porque foi um é, desbravador, um intelectual muitíssimo importante para nós outros e nós outras, porque foi a primeira pessoa que visualizou intelectualmente esta ideia do que seria o direito à cidade, aunque sabemos que antes de Lefebvre, muitos outros eh, acadêmicos intelectuais já criticavam os processos de planificação urbana, já criticavam os processos de injustiça urbana, mas há um mérito em Henri Lefebvre porque foi o intelectual que efetivamente criou eh, este, este nomenou eh, em seu livro eh, o que nós outro hasta hoje chamamos de direito à cidade. Lefebvre é um intelectual é, muito profundo, depois desenvolveu esta ideia em outros livros que, para mim, são muito mais importantes para compreender o direito à cidade. Por exemplo, este livro Espaço e Política, que, que também é conhecido como O Direito à Cidade 2, para mim é um, é um livro, livro muito mais importante para entender a ideia lefebriana de, de direito à cidade. E eu não vou me profundizar, eu não vou me quedar aqui sobre a obra de Lefebvre, porque, porque não tenho tanto tempo para isso, mas simplesmente dizer-lhes que Lefebvre era um intelectual de uma tradição marxista que fazia uma crítica a partir destes referentes marxistas, que para Lefebvre não necessariamente o direito à cidade era um direito legal, Aunque utilize esta nomenclatura de direito, não estava falando de um direito legal, de uma norma especificamente, é, como, como o próprio autor dizia, é muito mais como um grito, uma reivindicação social, do que um direito é, legalizado, positivado, é, e que a, a principal reivindicação lefebriana de uma é, utopia coletiva era a construção de uma nova sociedade. E eu diria, sintetizaria com eh, esta frase do professor David Harvey, de que, em realidade, o direito à cidade é o próprio direito de cambiarmos a nós outros e nós outras, eh, fazendo o cambio de las cidades. Harvey, que também é um intelectual de tradição marxista, e por isso está aqui eh, pondo muito mais luz em los processos sociais do que necessariamente em los processos jurídicos propriamente dichos. Depois eu vou falar um pouco disso, porque eu creio eh, que há um problema falso, uma dicotomia eh, falsa alrededor desta questão. Acá também eh, eh, lhes dizendo que este processo é histórico, não é somente um processo acadêmico, é um, especialmente um processo de movimentos sociais globais, é um referente importante, um marco importante é a Carta Mundial para o Direito à Cidade. E aqui já percebemos muitas das características importantes do que entendemos por direito à cidade, como um direito de uso fruto equitativo das cidades, é, de, a partir de princípios de sustentabilidade, democracia, equidade e justiça social o direito à cidade como um direito coletivo, necessariamente, de todos os habitantes das cidades, é um direito como tal, como direito humano, que é interdependente, é, está conectado com todos os demais direitos humanos, então, que precisamos ter liberdades civis, precisamos ter é, condições sociais, econômicas, culturais, de meio ambiente que sejam adequadas também para que o direito à cidade seja efetivado, porque esta interdependência é uma característica de todos os direitos humanos. E acá, em los últimos eh, anos, a plataforma global para o direito à cidade também ha tenido um esforço, esforço com todos os membros para tentar uh, produzir uma definição do que seria este direito a partir de uma mirada de los movimentos eh, sociais, e é a ideia de que este é um direito de todos e todas que habitam as cidades, tanto as 
eh, relaciones actuales como las futuras. Entonces, acá hay un principio de una solidaridad intergeneracional eh, que está muy cerca con la idea también de derecho a un medio ambiente ecológicamente equilibrado. Entonces, esta idea de solidaridad intergeneracional es importante que estos habitantes no necesariamente son solamente los habitantes permanentes, pero también son migrantes, son también personas que trabajan en, las, en una ciudad, pero viven o residen en otra ciudad, personas que están allí en procesos temporarios en la ciudad, eh, de ocupar, utilizar, producir, transformar, gobernar y disfrutar de las ciudades, asentamientos, pueblos, vilas, de manera justa, inclusiva, segura, sostenible y democrática. Y un aspecto importante es el reconocimiento de que las ciudades son bienes comunes a partir de esta idea de que son creaciones colectivas. Creo que Edesio eh, va a nos brindar mucho más, va a nos regalar mucho más con esta idea de ciudades como bien común eh, hoy. Eh, un destaque también para la nueva agenda urbana de 2016 de la conferencia Habitat 3, que incluyó eh, expresamente eh, el derecho a la ciudad en su texto, y hay estos puntos acá están también eh, referendados en esta agenda urbana de la ONU, eh, con puntos bastante positivos, pero también es importante decirles que hay puntos que eh, estaban, eh, estaban presentes en las versiones preliminares de la agenda, pero en su versión definitiva fueron quitados. Entonces, esta idea de ciudad como bien común no está declarada en la agenda, no se habla de ningún, ninguna manera de derechos de la población LGBT, eh, QI+, eh, no se habla de democracia en la nueva agenda urbana, no se habla de justicia social en la nueva agenda urbana. Entonces, evidentemente, logramos obtener el derecho a la ciudad y su reconocimiento, pero no es este derecho a la ciudad pleno que la plataforma visualiza, no es necesariamente el derecho a la ciudad que el documento oficial de la ONU reconoce. Hay aspectos acá que no fueron reconocidos ni declarados. Entonces, eh, para finalizar, lo que yo estoy llamando de problemas falsos eh, desde la perspectiva de derecho a la ciudad. Y explico mejor por qué estoy llamando de problemas falsos. Eh, yo, yo estoy actuando hace muchos años con, con los colegas de la plataforma, incluso antes de, de la Plataforma Global por el Derecho a la Ciudad, y en todos estos años estoy escuchando, oyendo eh, personas eh, declarando este tipo de afirmación, y yo creo que son problemas que nosotros deberíamos superar desde inmediato en la primera clase de este curso. Entonces, lo primero problema... ¿Sí? Más cinco minutos. Ok, Rodrigo. Gracias. Eh, lo primer problema es que el derecho a la ciudad es incompatible con la lucha institucional. Normalmente esta crítica es hecha por personas eh, que se apegan mucho más a la idea lefebriana de que el derecho a la ciudad no debería estar en las leyes, no deberían estar en las políticas públicas, etcétera, etcétera. Yo creo que este es un problema falso, primero porque históricamente los movimientos, organizaciones están sí reivindicando una agenda de demandas institucionales. Nosotros tenemos acá ejemplos de constituciones de países, leyes de países, le constituciones como de la Ciudad de México, de compromisos internacionales. Entonces yo creo que eh, las luchas también por cambios institucionales son importantes para avanzarmos eh, en los aspectos, primero, de la eh, del reconocimiento de este derecho por, por los países, organismos internacionales, etc., pero también por todo eh, lo sistema de irrisibilidad de estos derechos. Si, no to, si nosotros no tenemos el reconocimiento oficial, también es muy más difícil 
é, exigir a implementação destes direitos. E esta luta não é uma luta é, que tem qualquer problema ou, ou a falta de coerência com uma ideia utópica também de direito à cidade. Nós podemos manter a ideia utópica, mas em los aspectos tácticos, entender também que é importante influenciar e incidir sobre os aspectos institucionais. E o próprio Lefebvre autoriza também este aspecto. Lefebvre dizia que é eh, muito mais grave não implementar o direito à cidade do que implementar uma ideia mais realista de direito à cidade, ou uma ideia possível neste contexto histórico de direito à cidade. Pensando que estamos sempre em um processo de avanços, então estamos avançando, logrando vitórias a a, a, a pouco, pero também construindo um acúmulo histórico para um direito à cidade mais pleno. Por exemplo, utilizo aqui um exemplo de Brasil, da campanha de desalojos zero. Nós outros estamos peleando com o poder judiciário para que neste momento de pandemia não se promueva eh, decisões judiciais para desalojar pessoas. Sabemos que isto é um logro pequeno frente a todo o desafio de direito à cidade. Mas é importante porque temos que viver, temos que sobreviver hoje para continuar lutando para o direito à cidade amanhã. Então, um logro institucional como este é um logro tremendo, é um logro super importante para acumular forças e avançar também em la dimensão mais plena, mais utópica de direito à cidade. Um segundo problema que eu considero que é falso é que o direito à cidade não é um direito humano porque não está declarado em nenhum tratado oficial como o tratado, o Pacto Internacional de Direitos Econômicos, Sociais e Culturais, por exemplo. Eu creio que este é um falso problema porque, primeiro, nós outros não podemos confundir os direitos humanos com, lo, com a burocracia de los direitos humanos. Não é a ONU é a autoridade máxima para declarar o que é ou o que não é um direito humano. Os processos de reivindicação de direitos humanos nunca começaram por um tratado. O tratado é um resultado de um processo muito mais amplo amplio socio jurídico de reivindicação. Então, para mim, dizer que só são direitos humanos aqueles que estão declarados em los tratados, não faz sentido nisso, porque estamos fazendo um argumento extremamente burocrático e nós outros não somos burocratas, aunque atuemos em los, uh, em las arenas em los ambientes também burocráticos de la ONU, óbvio que atuamos aí, pero não somos burocratas de los direitos. Por, e eh, um outro aspecto que para mim eh, também é eh, importante é que mesmo los direitos humanos que já estão declarados como los direitos à vivienda e la água, aún não são efectivados e nós outros continuamos tendo que reafirmar que vivienda é direito humano, que água é direito humano, que os direitos de la mulheres são direitos humanos, estão declarados, mas não há eh, garantia de que serão efetivos. Então, para mim, dizer que o direito à cidade não é um direito humano não nos ajuda em nada. Bom, bueno, uh, o terceiro problema que eu considero falso é que o direito à cidade apenas valora e celebra os estilos de vida urbano e que ignora eh, as ruralidades, que ignora outras territorialidades. Eu creio que isto também é falso. Nós não consideramos a cidade como a grande metrópole, não é isso. Nós não estamos reivindicando um direito às cidades de hoje, porque são cidades desiguais, injustas. O direito à cidade é, sobretudo, o direito, o direito de construir, de eh, visionar uma outra cidade. E eu diria que aqui a ideia de cidade é a ideia de assentamentos humanos, não somente de las grandes cidades. 
e obviamente que não, há, não existe ciudad se não há também outras maneiras de territorialidade possíveis e reconhecidas. A quarta eh, ideia que eu considero que é esparsa é es que o direito à ciudad é uma agenda específica de los movimentos latino-americanos, porque há um processo histórico, eh, efectivamente, de muita tradição, eh, de que os movimentos latino-americanos estão falando de direito à ciudad há muitos anos, mas eh, sabemos que há coalizões europeias, há redes em Estados Unidos, há pessoas em África, em Índia, em outros países asiáticos, como Indonésia, Malásia, Coreia, há muitos processos europeus. Então, eu não diria mais que é um tema latino-americano, porque efetivamente não é um tema latino-americano, este é um tema global, porque o problema urbano é um problema global. E os movimentos sociais sabem disso e estão se articulando a partir de, desta ideia. E o último é que o eh, direito à cidade eh, não é o mesmo que direito que é o mesmo que direitos humanos em las cidades. Eu não vou ter nem tempo para profundizar em isto. Eh, Acá eh, apenas lhes revelo que direitos humanos é um aspecto somente de los direitos à cidade, do direito à cidade, pero o direito à cidade é muito mais amplo do que simplesmente dizermos que estamos aplicando os direitos humanos em la cidade. Há uma distinção aí é, muito sensível de dizer direitos em la cidade, de dizer direito a la cidade. E é, lhes, lhes uh, remeto a este, este texto que é muito interessante, do professor Peter Marcuse, que está em um livro que foi organizado por la querida Ana Suigranes, que se chama Ciudades para Todos. Creio que muitos de vocês conhecem esse livro. E o professor Peter Marcus faz esta argumentação super interessante que diferencia um tanto eh, por que é importante falar de um direito unitário à la ciudad. Por fim, que o direito à cidade é muito genérico, é muito abstrato, não sabemos o que é o direito à cidade, é um direito, direito de difícil é, compreensão. E aqui não sou eu, Henrique, que vou contestar a este falso problema, serão, serão vocês, serão os movimentos sociais, por exemplo, esta campanha maravilhosa de StreetNet sobre o direito à cidade e que nos mostra de maneira sencilla, concreta, o que é o direito à cidade e o que não é o direito à cidade. Então, quando nós respeitamos a economia informal, respeitamos os vendedores, as mulheres que estão eh, produzindo informalmente em las calles, estamos efectivando o direito à cidade. Quando praticamos violência contra estes vendedores, estamos negando o direito à cidade. Eu não compreendo como isto poderia ser difícil de entender. Para mim é muito concreto, é muito simples é, compreender o que é ou o que não é o direito à cidade em los territórios. Também como quando o grupo é, de gênero, é, de mulheres, gênero e diversidade da plataforma global por exemplo, em los marcos de 8M este ano, é, é, utiliza é, este, é, estas ideias como, como campanha, por exemplo, de que cidades livres de violência contra as mulheres é direito à cidade. Eu não compreendo como isso é abstrato, como isso é incompreensível. Não, isso é muito concreto. É, quando dizemos que é importante ter autonomia econômica para as mulheres, isto é muito concreto. Quando dizemos que é importante que as mulheres tenham direito a participar ativamente dos processos de planificação urbana, isto é muito concreto. Direito à cidade é equidade de gênero, não é algo abstrato. Quando a plataforma também argumenta sobre as funções sociais da cidade e nos diz que é direito à vivenda articulado com serviços públicos, com diversidade, com democracia, isso também é muito concreto. 
quando se elabora um decálogo sobre melhoramento barrial, isto é concreto, quando dizemos que os espaços públicos precisam ter inclusão social, isto é muito concreto. Então, eu não creio que isto seja um problema real. Eu não tenho mais tempo, há algumas ideias de síntese, mas estas ideias, eu já he explicado estas ideias durante minha explanação e esta apresentação será enviada a vocês, então vocês depois poderão ter acesso também a estas ideias de síntese. Então, aqui me quedo. Muchas gracias por su atención y ahora eh, estaré muy feliz de también escuchar al que nos va a regalar Edeso Fernández. Gracias, Rodrigo. Gracias a ti, Enrique. Muchísimas gracias por su presentación eh, tan, tan especial y aclaradora. Eh, me gustó muchísimo los mitos, los falsos mitos de, del derecho a la ciudad. Uh, Edesio, ahora contigo, también muchas gracias por tu participación. Adelante. Edesio, no te escucho. Ok, now? Ahora sí. So, thank you. I mean, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Edesio Fernandes. I am a Brazilian uh, legal scholar, as well as urban planner based in London. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. I'd like to thank all my colleagues and friends from the Global Platform for the Right to the City for this invitation. And it's wonderful also to share this opportunity with Enrique. I was completely fascinated by his introduction that has made my own work much easier. So what I'm going to discuss with you is um, the basic contents of this paper that I've been writing for the global platform, uh, focusing on one of the many components of this broader notion of the right to the city, which is that of the city as a common good. And I'll do that from a more social legal viewpoint. And my main concern is how to give the notion of the right to the city more power, how to strengthen it, how to go even further than whatever has been achieved so far. I think that this notion of the common has become extremely fashionable recently. It has gained momentum in different contexts and it has been used by different groups in completely different contexts and also expressing different aspirations. So often we hear people talking about common goods, common interests, common spirit, urban commons, public order, public spaces, common, communal power, public or communal ownership, um, the common as a new regime of a socioeconomic, social political, and social territorial organization. But people use these expressions as if they were the same thing when they are not. Uh, they may be partly related to each other, they may partly overlap. We can put them together to some extent, but they essentially express different ideas with completely different uh, specific requirements as well as bringing about different implications. So I think it's very important in this discussion on the right to the city and more specifically, this discussion on the city as a common good to be a bit more precise, you know, to clarify a little bit more what we mean by common, you know, so that all the aspirations that we convey through the world, they can be fully understood and indeed at some point fully materialized. So the, the notion of the city as a common good is one of the most popular components of the right to the city. It's, been, it's become increasingly more 
um, referred to by movements internationally, but it remains unexplored. It remains underdeveloped. And it's difficult in the sense that not enough effort has been made to give it a, a more consistent meaning. I think we have to explore this notion based on the assu this assumption that uh, a more precise social legal use of some context is necessary for the right to the city to gain meaning, depth, and power. And again, we, can be dis we could be discussing the notion of the city as a common good from several viewpoints, an economic viewpoint, a cultural viewpoint. What I'm, I'm trying to explore is what it means from a social legal perspective. What, what are the possible dimensions of this notion, as well as what are the conditions for the materialization and enforcement of this notion of the city as a common good? So my initial questions are, I think whenever one talks about the reclaiming the city that has been advocated by so many social movements internationally, movements that have embraced this idea of the right to the city, I would say that uh, in order to consolidate all the gains that we have made so far, in order to go further, we should be discussing how to give it a more concrete legal meaning as well. I think we should be addressing three main questions. How to give a more concrete legal meaning to the right to the city? What should a contemporary social legal take on the notion of the city as a common good be like? And how can an articulated land and territorial governance framework give this legal meaning to the notion of the city as a common good? So as Enrique also showed you, we have a number of fascinating, inspiring, you know, appealing movements taking place internationally, embracing this notion of uh, reclaiming the city, reclaiming the streets, reclaiming land as part of this broader struggle for the recognition of the right to the city. I, I'm just saying that uh, perhaps we should be exploring this notion a little bit, a little bit more from a social uh, legal viewpoint. Um, my general argument is that over the decades, in fact, I mean, since the 1970s, you know, I think the notion of uh, the right to the city has been gradually discussed. You know, it has gained more and more meaning, more content, but it, be it remains more a social political notion. It is a political platform, it is a philosophical banner, it is a social call for action. But in legal terms, I think it remains a problematic notion. Although, as Enrique also uh, showed us, we should also recognize how important documents, national laws, and many other uh, treaties, conventions, and uh, you know, um, legal documents have gradually also incorporated this notion, which has also been applied by a number of uh, groundbreaking initiatives. Some of the components of the right to the city, for example, participation, have gained a more consistent meaning and further recognition in international and national legal documents. And generally speaking, they have a more consistent legal no nature. But I think they per se, they do, do not define the right to the city. One dimension that concerns me is that uh, we should be looking for ways of giving some degree of enforceability to the right to the city. That would be a basic requirement of the legal order. And that remains a challenge for the right to the city. How can it be fully recognized and established? So we have a number of open questions social legal questions. What does the right to the city mean? Or what, what can it mean in terms of the legal rights, obligations, and responsibilities it begets? Who has the right to the city? Who can claim it? How can it be enforced? Who has the obligation to recognize it? And what, what happens if this right is not enforced? Is the right to the city necessarily dependent on the discretionary action of the public authorities where intentioned and progressive as they can be? Is the right to the city a subjective right that can be directly claimed by the interest, interested parties before the courts? 
or is it to be realized merely through so social policies promoted by the state? Are the urban communities always at the mercy of state action or can they have their right to the city recognized even against the will of the state? So there's a range of um, social legal questions that we should be discussing in order to understand the notion of the right to the city from a more social legal viewpoint. And Hickey has made use of some of the, the, the same image, images to show how this movement has been growing, you know, but in order to consolidate and go further, we should be exploring some of these questions in a more precise way. So there are many challenges then to the materialization of the right to the city, as Enrique also stressed. We have growing disputes around the notion, you know, which mean different things to different groups. And over the last 10 years or so, there's a new phenomenon, which is until then, the right to the city used to be a narrative or um, a claim or a demand exclusively associated with the urban poor. More and more, we have seen that the very notion of the, of the right to the city has been also taken over in many cases by other socioeconomic groups. So we have disputes, we have conflicts. And, and as I said, it remains more established as a social political platform or a philosophical banner than as a legal right. I myself think that it is important to give it a more solid legal meaning so that this dimension of enforceability and responsibilization of all the stakeholders can become more solid. Um, I think that it is, is the condition for us and for this notion to enable urban reform at once, as well as pointing out towards further structural changes in urban development, thus rescuing the original notion of the right to the city expression, which is far more transformational than merely the recognition of rights. So to give a social legal meaning to the notion of the city as a common good, to my mind, is a means of strengthening the broader notion of the right to the city. I think we should be exploring this notion of what it means the city as a common good, as a way of um, you know, giving power, giving content, giving enforceability, giving more meaning to the notion of the right to the city. One way of doing that is by expanding a discussion that many people have been promoting, which is that of common goods in the city. But I would add another dimension, which is perhaps more inspiring, a little more exciting, which is to view this discussion of the city as a common good, also from the viewpoint of this broader social political mobilization that has been taking place internationally about the notion of the common or the commons. I think there's a lot to be gained from this articulation between the city as a common good and this broader movement claiming for the recognition of the regime of the common as a means of giving the right to the city a more powerful meaning, which is closer to its original uh, definition, in fact. So my attempt so far has been to come up with a conceptual framework, a way of putting together different levels of uh, expectations, aspirations, and claims around this notion of the common such as um, related to the notion of the city as a common good. So one first dimension is that uh, there is this urgent need for the legal order to recognize you know, a set of material as well as immaterial common goods in the city. But at the same time, I think we should be uh, discussing how the legal order should embrace and um, protect notions which are interarticulated, such as the social function of property, the social value of land, the social functions of the city, and the social function of habitats. A third dimension that we should be exploring is that uh, it is important also for the land structure in a given city to fully recognize a set of common lands or urban commons within the city's land and governance structure. And 
the fourth one is perhaps a little more uh, utopian, which is the importance of at some point, you know, going beyond the notion of uh, urban reform, but, it, but thinking more in terms of urban revolution, the recognition of the common shared legal power, including the responsibilities, obligations, and rights of all city dwellers, private uh, stakeholders, social community, voluntary and academic sectors, and the public authorities, regarding all forms of decision-making involved in the constitution and functioning of the city. So um, also as Enrique emphasized in his final comments, I think at some point we should be discussing this intimate um, relationship between the right to the city and the right to territorial organization, the territorial base of the right to the city. This is crucial especially thinking of the challenges increasingly posed by the current um, pandemic, the widely expected future pandemics, and also the ongoing climate change and processes. I think social inclusion, social economic sustainability and resilience, all the claims that we have been defending, if they are supposed to be more than mere declarations of intentions, they need to be territorialized. They need to be fully translated onto the territory of the city so that they can be legally claimed any force. So this notion of territorial responsibility um, and this notion of the collective right to a territorial organization is crucial to give a more concrete social legal meaning to the notion of the city as a common good. So let me try and explore these main um, ideas a little bit more. What we see happening, and I'm sure that all of you can come up with a number of interesting, groundbreaking, original, community-led processes taking place in your cities, in your countries, and elsewhere. We see a number of fascinating community organization strategies complementing, when not replacing, the lack of state action, showing that the public sphere can no, can no longer be reduced to the state sphere. Everything that is related to the state sphere is public, but not everything that is related to this public sphere is stated. But often we see that these community processes, they've been using the banner of the right to the city. They are vibrant social political processes full of promises, but very quickly they are declared to be illegal informal, irregular, and thus repressed, criminalized, instead of gaining scale, instead of being replicated. Is this a natural order of things or can it be changed? Why are all these strategies illegal? And how can the legal order fully embrace them? These are questions that I've been asking myself when I see such fascinating community-led movements, you know, in the case of many of the Brazilian favelas during the pandemic, you have the Central Unica das Favelas coming up with a number of uh, highly effective strategies, replacing the lack of state action in this context of uh, the pandemic in uh, the informal settlements. Uh, one of them is the proliferation of uh, strategies of urban agriculture, food production and distribution that's challenging and changing entirely the dynamics of this process. You know, everywhere now you have very significant experiments gaining scale, but again, always within the context of highly debatable, uh, condemned, repressed, criminalized strategies. We see uh, in many countries this fascinating processes of uh, communities establishing community land trusts, which is a completely different form of having access to land and housing in cities, you know, in a collective way, much closer to the notion of self-management, which is so essential to, the, essential to the notion of the right to the city. We see in many contexts, experience, experiences of uh, cooperatives in all forms of uh, collective organization coming up with um, solutions for problems such as housing, sanitation, uh, education, health services, you know, 
in, in Brazil and many other Latin American countries, we have increasingly more organized processes of uh, community um, territorial organization, the formation of new settlements, which obey most of the legal requirements, you know, and, and they are self um, managed in a fantastic way. What they, they have been saying is that they can do most of the things uh, by themselves, but there is one fundamental issue um, which still requires state intervention, which is that of the recognition of land rights. You know, at the same time, over the last two decades, we have seen more and more social political movements internationally embracing the notion of the common or commons, you know. And as I said before, I think we should be looking at these movements to understand how we can associate the right to the city with this discussion on the importance of the commons. I mean, we see more and more movements using the notion of the common good, you know, in order to justify social mobilization and a set of claims and demands. But we also see, you know, uh, this uh, growing movement claiming for the recognition of a social territorial regimen, a social economic, a social political form of production, distribution, circulation, appropriation of economic resources, beginning with land. So there's something happening there and we should be paying attention to these movements to understand what they mean, leading to this more daring proposal, which is that uh, we should be viewing the whole city as a commons, not urban commons in the city, but the whole city viewed as a commons. So we have many things to pay attention there. And I think this movement over the last two decades has happened as a, a strong reaction against two combined phenomena. On the one hand, we have this widespread dominance of a legal political culture that keeps supporting and promoting in a most uh, unqualified way, the notion of absolute individual property rights, leading to an extreme process of commodification of land, housing, services, and natural resources. This is a process that Raquel Ronick and David Harvey have explored in detail in their work. But on the other hand, we also see this widespread dominance of a legal political culture that has supported and promoted the system of political representation as if it were the sole form of social political organization. And this is a system that has long favored the interest of London property owners and other private stakeholders to the detriment of the needs, claims, and indeed rights of the vast majority of the urban population. So how can we break with this uh, dominant paradigm. So there's this conceptual movement there allowing for a much broader social legal take on the notion of the city as a common good. We, we have to understand that we are reacting against this dominant exclusionary paradigm. We have to, to understand that unregulated economic globalization, unfettered financial capitalism, and elitist social political neoliberalism combined in such a powerful way, you know, they have turned cities in both the arena and the object of unqualified capital accumulation, thus leading to the resulting global urban crisis, which has made has been made even worse during the ongoing pandemic. So this notion of the city as a collective creation, it is fundamental to the notion of the right to the city, but how can we guarantee that the wealth produced by all is appropriated and distributed fairly and equitably? So again, this I was quite pleased to see not long ago that one of my arguments was turned it into a graffiti in, um, in Cape Town, this notion of uh, cities are a collective creation, therefore the benefits and costs must be shared equally by all. The big challenge is how to do that. So, um, so let's explore this notion a little bit more. I mean, this is not a new uh, idea. Henri Lefebvre uh, 
uh, back in the late sieges when he, you know, coined the expression, the right to the city. He said that, that the city is a fist. It is a disputed ego, but it is a collective creation, a living being which is collectively produced. It is a place of aspirations, possibilities, and encounters. And then he described, and after him, David Harvey and many other uh, thinkers as well, they have described how the social production of urban space, space is not only the result of the action by individuals and private actors, nor merely the result of state action. So the opportunities, benefits, and all the wealth created by urban development results from this collective mm -hmm. enterprise. So the city is produced by all. You know, it should be in more traditional um, social political terms, view, be viewed as a common good. It is the dynamic, concrete expression of uh, the relational obligations all urban actors have to care for their common interests. So this notion that uh, the city is a collective creation means that uh, you have a number of material okay. facilities in the cities, institutional services, cultural codes, environmental resources that serve common interest in cities. But more than that, you know, we should also understand that uh, all urban actors have in common the very life and soul of the city itself with all its endless possibilities. So as a common good, the city in its material, social, economic, political, institutional, cultural, and environmental dimensions is an asset. It is a manifold resource that should be fairly um, shared, equitably shared, you know, by all individuals, social groups, and urban communities. But unfortunately, we've never been further than this, you know, more traditional scenario. Uh, and he showed some of uh, Lefebvre's uh, original books, you know, exploring this notion of the city as a collective creation. But there, exactly because at that point, he wasn't really that concerned with the legal dimension of this discussion. We are talking about should, would, could. So we are still talking about a philosophical, social, political concept. My, my provocation is how can it become a legal concept too? giving a more enforceable legal nature and meaning to the right to the city. You know, I think we, we, we should explore that a little bit further than has been done so far. You have a number of uh, social legal questions to address. How and to what extent have the many problems affecting the urban poor you know, and excluded communities resulted from the legal order? You know, how has the legal order determined informality? You know, how has the legal system enabled an exclusionary pattern of urban development? How has the legal system made it possible for powerful social, social economic groups to capture the state apparatus and control the decision-making processes? But conversely, we should also be discussing how can ideally the legal order become a factor of inclusion and integration at least to some extent? What fundamental legal changes are necessary so that the right to the city can actually uh, um, lead towards urban reform and gradually to the promotion of structural changes in the pattern of urban development locally and globally. So this social legal perspective is important, I think, you know, viewed from a broad critical way. You know, we have to explore all these questions look for more tangible aspects, looking for conditions of enforcement, always, you know, by using a critical view of the law, but also this commitment to this notion that once improved, once expanded, the legal world that can help towards the materialization of the right to the city. I think that um, there's always going to be more to the right to the city than the legal world that can offer. You know, we can never lose this utopian, revolutionary nature of the right to the city notion. But there is, as Enrique also stressed, a possible dialect there between urban reform and urban revolution. You know, um, structural changes, they are not likely to be promoted through the legal system, but there's a lot we can achieve, you know, through 
a redefined, improved, and a more democratic legal system. I like very much this notion uh, Lefebvre proposed that we should dream of the impossible to seize the realm of the possible. So in order to do that, we have to break with the traditional human rights uh, understanding because it's still in the whole system, in fact, because it's still constrained by the recognition of individual rights. We still view human rights as individual rights. I mean, there has been a change, of course, in the human rights tradition. We talk about social rights, economic rights, cultural rights, you know, but they are exclusively to be recognized through state policies. There's, very na there's a very narrow room for collective rights. The rights to the citizens part of the declaration has not been up updated. The human rights tradition still expresses the notion of representative democracy as the sole way of social political organization. It still reduces the broader notion of the public to the narrow nature of the state. A state which, as I stressed before, is controlled by dominant groups in the representative tradition. So we should be explored the, the room for direct community participation, direct community action, so that this utopian collective self-management scenario is kept alive. So to view the right to the city as a collective right is crucial in legal terms as well, not only in social political terms. I think we should be understanding the right to the city as one of a set of new citizenship rights. Uh, it should be a binding social legal framework for governmental policies, laws, state action, and judicial decisions, as well as for the direct action processes of organized society. We should be considering how to make it a new collective right, also from a legal viewpoint. And as I mentioned before, we need to update and expand our human rights tradition. We should be uh, emphasizing the notion of collective rights. You know, much as I fully admire and embrace and promote and promote uh, groundbreaking initiatives such as human rights in cities or human rights um, cities, as Enrique also mentioned, I think to talk about human rights to the city is more than that. We should be exploring you know, what the conditions, including the legal conditions are for this narrative of human rights, collective rights to the city can be fully um, embraced. I mean, to expand representative democracy is crucial, but we should also be recognizing direct democracy. So the city as a common good should be considered within this broader, you know, social political discussion there. One book by Henri Lefebvre, his latest one, is very rarely mentioned. You know, it's called uh, of, uh, um, the contract of citizenship, because here, unlike the previous ones shown by Enrique and by myself a while ago, he discusses the importance of the legal recognition of the right to the city. You know, he says that we should be discussing a new set of collective rights to express the nature of contemporary life and social political dynamics. So he came up with a number of uh, interrelated political rights, the right to information, the right of expression, the right to culture, the right to identity, indifference and inequality, the right to self-management, the right to public and non-public services, and above all, the right to the city, no longer merely as a social political notion, but also as a legal notion, you know, a, a political right. I mean, so basically in his formulation, he's talking about a right that would um, um, articulate the right of habitation conceived in the broadest possible way with the right to participation. And he emphasizes the full recognition of use values 
in order to redress the historical imbalances without, um, resulting from the excessive emphasis on exchange values typical of the capitalist production of the urban space. So this link between cities and citizenship, citizenship rights, the rights to the city as a citizenship right is crucial so that we can confront this pattern of commodification, financialization of cities internationally. This emphasis on use values and use rights, you know, so we are talking here of a different take on the aspects of socioeconomic, political, cultural, and environmental processes of um, uh, appropriation, production, distribution, of resources as well as the recognition of rights. So we should be discussing more use rather than the notion of ownership. We should be also discussing more uh, what is a true public sphere than merely a state sphere. So by uh, recon arch reconciling and, and articulating these two dimensions, there's a lot that we can do in order to give a more legal meaning and content to the right to the city into the notion of the city as a common good. Again, you know, we are talking about use values and not only exchange values, possession rights and not only property rights, collective rights, not only individual rights, common um, land and not only state land. And also we are talking about the possibility for the, the organized community to directly participate in the organization of the territory. I'm talking about community planning. I'm talking about community action. I'm talking about community uh, formulation of a new set of collective uh, laws and uh, codes of behavior. So there's an enormous uh, amount of things to be considered there. I don't have enough time to discuss them all, but I'll just try and finish with uh, um, some specific um, comments here. I mean, again, we need to be more precise when we use common uh, notions such as common, right? The common. We've been using these uh, expressions as if they were the same thing when they are not. So basically, you know, we should be um, articulating to some extent, you know, the notion of common goods, goods of common use, uh, material and material goods in process of historical, historic culture and environmental interest, urban commons, the city as a common. And in order to do that, as I mentioned before, what I'm proposing is this uh, framework, which has four dimensions, you know, uh, a number of common goods in the city, which means this legal protection to material and immaterial land, natural, social, cultural assets and processes, including, you know, um, um, public spaces, the notion of urban commons in the existing land structure for urban agriculture, social housing, the green economy, leisure education through community action, the shared so common social political power enabling the community to go beyond state action. And also this utopian scenario of the city as a common, this ideal of community self management there. So again, this is at the heart of the discussion on the right to the city, this notion that we should be thinking in terms of a new social political citizenship contract for the city. Five more minutes, Adesio. Okay, about to finish. I mean, I don't have time to explore, but there's a number of strategies happening already in many places, um, indicating how the shared common power you know, creating a true public sphere could, could, could be like a community involvement in committees and commissions, community plans, participatory budgeting processes, sortition, citizen assemblies, public initiatives for the proposal of laws, collective judicial actions, popular courts to decide on all sorts of conflicts. Um, but also, in some cases, a specific document has been constructed collectively kind of a city constitution, you know, they can and they should also be legally binding to some extent. They're, they're distributing powers, responsibilities and obligations from the um, municipal um, organic laws in, in so many municipalities in Brazil and elsewhere to the master plans which have been 
formulated and approved in, through collective processes to some extent to the political constitution of the city of Mexico, which explicitly recognized the right to the city, you know, to the Montreal uh, Charter of the rights and obligations of all citizens. We have a number of strategies happening internationally trying to give meaning to this notion of a new social political contract for the cities. We have these experiments of urban commons taking place in many European cities and elsewhere. Some of them, in fact, have already designed a new institutional framework for themselves so that they can give some content to this notion of the city as a common. So my final point is, all that requires this emphasis on a land governance framework. This is a crucial dimension, you know, to discuss social function of habitat and property, social value of land, to change the position of planning and management, to change the nature of urban development, to emphasize use, use values, community, commun communal rights, urban commons, community plans, capture value mechanisms. You have a number of issues. I don't have the time to explore them, but I'll leave the PowerPoint with you. There's a huge list of uh, uh, aims and targets that this land government governance framework should aspire at in order to change structurally the nature of urban um, development. And finally, you know, my last point is, you see, again, thinking of the pandemic, future pandemics, climate changes, you know, we need to think in terms of a collective right to a new way of organizing the territory. We have, we have to find a better articulation between the new urban agenda mentioned by Enrique and the, the 2030 30 agenda, which emphasizes more environmental matters. We have to articulate urban housing, transportation, environmental, budgetary policies among themselves, but also with the underlying land policy. So my question is, should we be discussing also a collective right to territorial organization? So this is uh, to finish, you know, my two or three central messages here is the importance of law and legal rights, which I think is often neglected, the importance of the land framework, which is often underestimated, and the need to decolonize our view of uh, the social political citizenship order. Firstly, by breaking with the, the notion that uh, state action is exclusive, this narrative is exclusive. Secondly, by widening the scope for community action. And thirdly, by recognizing communities as subjects of rights and not merely as at the mercy of uh, state action. One example, the constitution of Mexico uh, city that recognized the right to the city for the first time about a month ago, the group in charge of uh, this right came up with a recommendation on the use of public space. I'm looking for a different from, framework in which people would have rights, not merely recommendations for uh, public agents. You know, I think we should be discussing how to create a true public sphere as a condition for the materialization of this notion of uh, the common. So thank you. That was what I had to uh, offer. It's big and broad and uh, a little too theoretical, but there's a lot happening in terms of new strategies, in terms of new uh, experiments. And we have to look, uh, like Henrique also stressed, to whatever has been happening in the streets in order to learn from this movement and bring you know, some elements to our more conceptual discussion here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adesio. It was once more a pleasure to hear you. And I think you brought a lot of questions to, to make our uh, had an easy many questions to to think about and to reflect on uh, and thank you so much Adesio and Enrique to keep the time because we will take this last 15 minutes to try to address some questions from the participants who wrote in the chat so please if you have any questions as well feel free to write in the chat 
And we have so far two main questions now addressed uh, to the participants, to Edesio and Enrique. Uh, two, the two are in Spanish, so I'll try to use my best Portuguese or Spanish to, to read those questions in Spanish, but it's, uh, it's not that I'm very familiar with the Spanish, but I'll try to read them for Edesio and Enrique. Uh, Verushka Vila Vicencio uh, pregunta, uh, Las niñas, niños, adultos mayores, personas con discapacidad, están ausentes en las políticas públicas con condiciones de accesibilidad e inclusión que les permitan usar y disfrutar la ciudad. Ahora, con la pandemia, habrá que innovar en el acceso a los espacios públicos y servicios. ¿Hay nuevas prácticas que nos puedan compartir? Y yo, yo gustaría más de, de hablar no solamente de las prácticas, más más allá que la pregunta de Verushka es cómo cómo se ven a esos grupos como niños o mayores o otros grupos más vulnerables en ese proceso de construcción colectiva del derecho a la ciudad o qué respuesta el derecho a la ciudad Uh, intenta dar a los derechos de esos grupos más vulnerables. Entonces, una pregunta que, que hace, haga el diálogo entre derecho a la ciudad y grupos vulnerables. Y la otra pregunta es de Omar, que enfoca un poco más los temas la dimensión rural. rural. Acerca de la discusión que se puede dar en torno a la superación de la dicotomía campo-ciudad o la dicotomía rural-urbano, ¿qué pertinencia tiene la dimensión rural en la lucha por el derecho a la ciudad? Yo creo que Enrique ya empezó un poco a hablar de eso y es Desio también, pero creo que es un buen momento de, de hablarnos con un poco más de calidad de eso. Tendremos en una de las próximas clases un momento solo para hablar de, los, uh, de las conexiones urbano-rurales, pero tal vez sea un momento de empezarmos a profundizar ese, esa conexión. Entonces, Enrique, después el Desio, si, si pueden, Enrique, ¿me escucha? Sí, sí, sí. sí muchas gracias por las preguntas. Eh, Súper interesante. Es, es verdad, Rodrigo, que durante el curso muchos de los temas serán, eh, regresaremos a muchos de estos, de estos temas, entonces si no conseguimos contestar a, a todos y todas hoy, ciertamente al, al long, uh, durante todo el curso vamos a tener otras oportunidades con otros invitados, invitadas también para discutir estos temas. Eh, sobre los aspectos eh, de los niños, niñas, mayores, eh, personas con discapacidad, eh, yo creo que lo que nosotros estamos viviendo, incluso también las mujeres, eh, lo que nosotros estamos viviendo durante este momento de pandemia, en que vemos que las violaciones de, de derechos están cada vez más graves contra estos grupos, es que estos grupos son grupos históricamente subordinados a partir de las lógicas eh, hierárquicas, eh, capitalistas, machistas, capacitistas también, eh, que eh, hacen con que estos grupos no tengan los mismos accesos a derechos que los hombre, hombres blancos, varones blanco, blancos, etc. Y tal. Entonces, la pandemia evidencia mucho más este, estas desigualdades, pero son desigualdades estructurales de, de nuestras sociedades y evidentemente la manera como las ciudades van siendo construidas y los modelos de des, desalojo, eh, desarrollo urbanos también eh, van siendo constituidos a partir de esta estructura de desigualdades. Pero yo diría, eh, contestando muy, de manera muy sencilla y, y breve, por ejemplo, que en primer lugar, una de las ideas de mi presentación en aquellas ideas síntesis, que, que me faltó tiempo, 
es la idea de que en inglés es, es un chiste, es mm, eh, como, como un juego de palabras. En inglés yo, yo digo que cities for all must be cities for everyone. En, en, en portugués y en español este chiste no funciona tan bien porque sería ciudades para todos son ciudades para todos. <ríe> en inglés hay una distinción entre cities for all and cities for everyone. Eh, y lo que lo quiero decir con eso es que muchas veces cuando anunciamos cities for all, este all, este todos, normalmente son varones. Son varones blancos, son varones que no son, no son crianças, não são niños, não são eh, pessoas maiores. Normalmente é um padrão eh, hierárquico de nossas sociedades. E eu creio que o primeiro desafio é o reconhecimento de que eh, niños, niñas, mulheres, eh, povos tradicionais são cidadãos e têm direito de participar tienen derecho de decir también lo que quieren de su ciudad. Entonces, aquí eh, Verusca nos, nos pregunta sobre iniciativas prácticas novedosas. Esta es una iniciativa nuestra en el Instituto Polis en Brasil, que as, a, a, organizamos talleres públicos en las calles eh, de São Paulo, por ejemplo, con estos mapas muy grandes, y pedimos que la gente de, que está allí los peatones, las personas que viven, incluso los, los niños y las niñas participen y nos digan lo que quieren de su ciudad. Y escriben ideas y ponen ideas y proponen, etcétera, etcétera. Esta es una iniciativa de los movimientos sociales, de una organización de la sociedad civil, pero que podría muy bien ser incorporada, incorporada a prácticas públicas de planificación urbana y también de, de construcción de políticas públicas. Entonces, yo creo que un primer desafío es reconocer que estas personas son personas, son ciudadanos y ciudadanas también, porque muchas veces se quita el derecho de participación de eh, muchas categorías sociales porque no son eh, las categorías hegemónicas que detienen el poder. Yo creo que tenemos que discutir esto cuando discutimos eh, iniquidades urbanas, principalmente. Sí. Y la otra, la, la otra cuestión de lo rural, por ejemplo, hay muchas iniciativas y, y cómo podemos superar. Primero, un reconocimiento de que las ciudades son sistemas vivos que consumen muchos alimentos, consumen mucha agua, consumen mucha energía y no producen estas cosas. Entonces las ciudades son sistemas que están eh, eh, en un sistema global eh, de medio ambiente muy más amplio. Entonces precisamos superar esta dicotomía urgentemente porque donde, donde eh, eh, se producen los alimentos de las ciudades, donde se produce la agua para la ciudad. Tenemos que pensar eso. No necesariamente todas las personas precisan migrar para las ciudades. Tenemos que considerar otras maneras de territorialidades. Este es un desafío. Evidentemente, yo como, como activista del derecho a la ciudad pienso que es un problema que tenemos sí que, que profundizar y que desarrollar mejor. Hay muchas iniciativas de agricultura urbana, de una economía que sea más circular entre la producción de residuos, la producción alimentaria, pensar la seguridad alimentaria también en el contexto urbano. Entonces, yo creo que hay muchos temas bajo esta cuestión entre rural y urbano, y que son temas muy concretos. Creo que a partir de estos temas concretos podemos nos pôr en marcha para superar esto. Es, para mí es más fácil superar a partir de temas concretos do que de un debate abstracto do que son las territorialidades o no. Gracias, Enrique Edesio. Y después tenemos más como un par de preguntas, de preguntas. Entonces, so just a quick comment. I think Enrique covered the whole uh, discussion very well. Just a quick comment. I think, um, you know, concepts, uh, expressions, they are always uh, kind of constrained 
by the conditions of their own creation. I mean, the, the notion of the right to the city is very, uh, it's a, a wonderful expression of the debates back in the, in the 1960s, right? I mean, a given context in which urbanization was is still a growing phenomenon. As you know, urbanization became the dominant pattern uh, as from 2008, but by then, 50 years ago, most people were still living uh, in, in rural areas, but cities were growing and the number of uh, problems associated with uh, urban development were coming to the fore, more attention was being paid to that, a new tradition of urban studies was then constituted. So this notion of the right to the city, in a way, it is kind of constrained by that historical context. And it's always been difficult to see, because again, what is city? Is it just the urban area of the city or does it include also the peri-urban areas? Does it include the, uh, the rural areas? You know, um, one of the false conflicts that um, Enrique mentioned before, which I think is um, a great way of, uh, you know, um, framing this discussion is that, you know, we should be viewed the, the, the notion of the right to the city for it's still very valid, very powerful way of putting people together, you know, putting movements together, articulating different experiences in these different parts of the world, uh, but recognizing also the different um, expressions, the different uh, manifestation of the processes. And one of um, um, lesson for that, if we want to update the notion of the right to the city, I think is by overcoming these uh, highly artificial divisions between urban, environmental, rural, right? I mean, and the way to do that is by focusing on the notion of the territory. The territory where, is where all these dimensions, you know, meet each other the urban, the rural, the peri-urban, you know, the, the, the environmental. And again, especially now as a result of uh, the pandemic, we know that more than ever, we cannot uh, afford to ignore the environmental dimension of, of this process, even because the pandemic itself had been created by this pattern of relationship between urban areas, rural areas, modernization of agriculture, deforestation. So they, everything is integrated. So that's why both Henrique and I, I think we finished with the same emphasis on the importance of uh, territorial or the territorial organization right to a given pattern of territorial uh, order. So I think that that's a crucial way of uh, putting all these elements together, overcoming, you know, false dichotomies and uh, artificial, you know, divisions in order to view what is a soul process in a more integrated way. I would keep the emphasis on the right to the city for all its powerful way of uh, bringing us together. But I think it's also important to um, stress these uh, different um, dimensions and different um, levels of manifestation of this process. So the notion of a collective right to the territorial organization, I think it's a very interesting modern contemporary way of um, articulating all that. Thank you, Adesio and Enrique. I'll pose two more questions. We will not be able to answer all the questions that you sent us, but I'm choosing two of them because I think they they are directly connected with the issues brought by Adesio and Enrique. The other questions, we'll probably answer them along of the course, along of the seven weeks, and I will come back to them and answer them and don't worry, at the end of the seven weeks, we will try to answer most of your questions, okay? Some of them, they, we don't have answers, but uh, for the ones that we have, we'll try to address them in, during the seven weeks. But two questions that uh, they brought, I think they are interesting in this dimension of territorial uh, right to a territorial organization and approach. One of them is from Ana Carola, que nos pregunta, ¿Cómo ven ustedes la demanda de los pueblos indígenas en las ciudades? Entonces, que trabaja un poco con esa dimensión, pero una otra lógica 
de organización y cómo eso se relaciona con las ciudades también. Entonces, una pregunta es esa. La otra pregunta es de Karim de Portere, que cómo se relaciona el derecho a la ciudad con las teorías de Castel sobre los bienes de consumo colectivo? Esa es una pregunta más a Edesio que la persona coloca, pero yo creo que es algo como también interesante para el diálogo acerca de los comunes, etc. Entonces, las dos preguntas y después de unos minutos más cerramos la sesión de hoy. Muchas gracias. Bien, entonces empiezo. Eh, yo, este es un, algo súper curioso e importantísimo como los pueblos indígenas en las ciudades también son reconocidos. Eh, en San Paulo, acá en Brasil, tenemos eh, una pelea eh, súper grande con pueblos indígenas que viven en las ciudades y que están reivindicando la preservación de su territorio en la mayor metrópolis eh, de Brasil. Y por todo el tiempo, el poder público no reconoce la, eh, solamente la existencia de estos pueblos, pero también eh, no reconoce sus derechos territoriales. Eh, yo creo que tenemos que avanzar como he dicho ya también puntuado en estos aspectos, estresar estas cuestiones de los componentes de derecho a la ciudad, porque evidentemente cuando decimos que las ciudades son para todos y todas, tenemos que reconocer que no somos todos y todas iguales. No somos iguales en género, no somos iguales en orientación sexual, no somos iguales en aspectos étnicos y a, a partir de esta idea de que hay una diversidad étnica, también tenemos que reconocer que hay sistemas culturales, sistemas sociojurídicos también eh, que determinan otras maneras de relación con los territorios. Y el derecho a la ciudad no nega eso, el derecho a la ciudad está eh, totalmente abierto a este reconocimiento de la diversidad, y yo creo que no es solamente eh, la diversidad, celebrar la diversidad, pero respetar y crear mecanismos efectivos para que esta diversidad cultural, étnica y socio-jurídica eh, de comunidades y grupos étnicos también eh, eh, pueda tener lugar en los territorios urbanos o, o periurbanos. Entonces, eh, yo creo que es muy importante tener eso y considerar también que muchos de los pueblos indígenas no son más aquellos pueblos indígenas de cinco séculos eh, cuando los europeos llegaron y invadieron a América. Entonces, son pueblos que, que están también, las, estas personas también están conectadas, también necesitan de servicios de salud, también necesitan de servicios de educación indígena, hay estructuras que demandan políticas públicas, entonces la ciudad, los gobiernos de la ciudad, las políticas públicas de la ciudad también deberían considerar la necesidad de los equipamientos de las políticas públicas también para esta población, que muchas veces no son los mismos equipamientos ni las mismas políticas públicas generales. Por ejemplo, el caso de la salud en Brasil, hay una política de salud específica para los pueblos indígenas con su participación, porque la, hay aspectos que son distintos de la salud general de la población. Entonces, es algo eh, importante para avanzar. Sobre el caso de, de Manuel Castel y la, los bienes de reproducción colectiva, eh, yo sé que esta fue una pregunta más dirigida a Ledesio, pero eh, históricamente hay una pelea entre Castells y Henri Lefebvre. Castel, Henri Lefebvre fue profesor de Castells y, y los dos eh, pelearon sobre este, este tema. Eh, una cosa curiosa es que acá en Brasil, cuando la idea de derecho a la ciudad llegó a Brasil en los 70, el eh, libro de Lefebvre fue traducido para portugués muy rápidamente, Inicio de los 70 ya había la versión en portugués, entonces muchos intelectuales, activistas, eh, ya conocían la idea de derecho a la ciudad eh, desde los 70 acá en Brasil, pero como un, eh, una querida amiga, profesora Bianca Tavolari, ha demostrado en su 
su investigación sobre la historia del derecho a la ciudad en Brasil, específicamente en el caso de Brasil, eh, esta, esta profesora ha demostrado que o, eh, ocurrió una, una especie de amálgama, una especie de eh, confusión entre la idea lefebriana y la idea de Manuel Castells entre los movimientos de Brasil, y eso constituyó una otra idea de derecho a la ciudad viva a partir de las demandas sociales. Entonces, lo que en primer momento, desde el punto de vista teórico, parecía una pelea, que no había solución, los movimientos en los territorios resolvieron esta pelea y dijeron, es necesario tener utopía para una otra ciudad, pero nosotros también necesitamos de vivienda, nosotros también necesitamos de vivienda pública, nosotros también necesitamos de transporte público. Eh, entonces, los movimientos pusieron las dos ideas, Lefebvre y Castel, en un mismo contexto de reivindicación y construyeron a su propia manera el derecho a la ciudad en Brasil y, y que originó el movimiento de reforma ur urbana en Brasil. Entonces, eh, apenas un chiste, una historia que, que les conta sobre cómo, cómo esto fue solucionado eh, por, los, por los movimientos sociales de Brasil muy tranquilamente. Lefebvre y Castells continuaron peleando y los movimientos resolvieron la cuestión. <risas> Gracias, Enrique. Edesio? Yeah, well, um, well the, the, the first question about uh, the importance of uh, the recognition of uh, indigenous groups' claims to land and the territory is fully um, you know, embraced by this uh, discussion on the city as a common good. And uh, you know, in the four dimension um, framework that I suggested, the, both the incorporation within the land structure of uh, specific uh, tracts of land that have specific um, ways of um, management, such as urban commons. We could also include those um, areas occupied by indigenous groups, by the quilombolas and many other groups, right? But also um, one dimension would, would be that of uh, the, the need for the legal order to recognize what has been called the social production of habitat, meaning the different ways that the different groups have had access to land, they have created their own housing conditions, they have had access to, to housing. So I think a, a legal system has to be um, encompassing enough to accommodate all these different um, ways of um, materially as well as symbolically and culturally producing uh, the space. What I think is important is to break with the way our legal urban order is still very much dictated by the notion of property, you know, um, and even the, the we, we defend the notion of the social function of property, but perhaps we should be defending with uh, renewed vigor the notion of the social value of land. I think it's more important to defend the, the notion of the social value of land, the so, social functions of the city, rather than the notion of the social function of property, because by doing that, we would be breaking with this emphasis on property ownership as the, the most important or you know, way of um, access to uh, land and social organization around land. So I think it's, uh, it's fully compatible with uh, this um, framework that we are discussing for um, this component of the right to the city, which is the city as a common good. Uh, and regarding, you know, the, the dispute, uh, I think it, it was, uh, you know, also um, solved not only by the so social movements, but also by the thinkers themselves. I mean, I think uh, 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 Castells very soon, he became more influential in this field of urban studies in France and elsewhere to the extent that uh, Lefebvre is to this date very much ignored in France. He's been always very much alive in the Latin American tradition. Over the last 10 years, he got a very significant uh, recognition in the Anglo-speaking world. I mean, uh, initially through uh, David Harvey's recognition and many others after that. Uh, 
But part of the reason for that is that um, Lefebvre's work is far more um, complex in the sense that um, he places more emphasis on culture, on politics, on conflicts, on disputes than Castells initially, you know, with his more structuralist view of the urban, what he called the urban question, you know, so uh, the urban space merely as produced by the state order and, and very little room for so, social movements, social conflicts and political disputes. But he himself soon recognized, I mean, um, maybe what, um, five years after the publication of um, uh, the urban question, he started a whole new range of books on social movements, you know, so he made this mea culpa in his own work by saying that he hadn't paid enough attention to the way communities themselves, they produce space, they have their own strategies, their, their own needs, um, sometimes in a, in, a, in a way which is ambiguously or, you know, intimately related to the state action sometimes against uh, the state order. You know, so I think that's why Lefebvre's work has survived better than that of Castells because it has always been more open to uh, these different levels of uh, politics, economics, uh, sociology, anthropology, his emphasis on the everyday life, you know, which is so crucial to our understanding of the right to the city today, right? Uh, but Again, Lefebvre and Castells initially paid very little attention to the legal phenomenon, right? I mean, um, Castells merely viewed the legal order as uh, the superstructure of the state action. Uh, Lefebvre, I interviewed him myself for my own PhD. In my own, I had five, 10 minutes only with him. And my, my question was that, so what does, you know, the right to the city mean to you in legal terms? Because this is someone who together with many other books on uh, the urban areas, the rural areas, the ideology, everyday life, you know that, he put together a series of four books, which are called Of the State, de l'État. So a whole range of topics discussed in the state and very little attention there to this, dimension of state action, which is the legal order. By then he didn't have an answer. The answer came out a year later, shortly before he died, through that book, uh, the cover of which I showed to you, which is the social um, political citizenship contract for the cities. That's where he explored the notion of the right to the city in a more social legal viewpoint, coming up with a set of collective rights, which together would update the declaration of the rights of citizens. You know, his point is, we look at the original document of the declaration of the rights of men and citizens. The rights of men have been updated so that we talk about the rights of women, the elderly, children, uh, dis you know, disabled people, uh, gay people, all sorts of communities, second generation rights, third generation human rights. But the second half, which is the Declaration of Rights of Citizens, hasn't been updated. We should reduce the possibilities for political action to the right to vote, to, have, uh, to express an opinion, and the rights of mobility. And, and he says, this is not enough to express the complexity of uh, contemporary life, especially as a result of uh, urbanization that has changed the world upside down. So we need to come up with uh, a proper set of uh, new political rights, which would be citizenship rights. So this link between city and citizenship then became essential to this understanding. So I think this is an interesting way to see how um, social movements, they don't need this theoretical formulation, but the theor theoretical formulation sometimes helps also to give a more precise meaning to um, empower, to strengthen, to consolidate uh, whatever social movements have achieved and, and thus take in this struggle even further to a different level. Thank you, Adesio, and thank you, Enrique. And thanks everyone for keeping uh, keeping 
for being here and until 15 minutes later and just to thank you all of you and to tell you that we'll meet again next week in the same time in the same uh not in the same link we will send you the new link to be here and uh speaking on diversity i promise you that we'll have a more of diverse people here not only white dudes white cisgender dudes uh, such as us today but uh, next week we will especially emphasize the gender and diversity dimension of the right to the city with the amazing Anna Falu and other colleagues of the working group on the right to the city on gender and diversity. So thank you so much and see you next week. Bye bye people. Thank you Enrique and Adesio. See you all. <laughs>